Action Coordinator for the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, this is a breakfast forum, which we hold on a monthly basis, uh, the fourth Wednesday of every month, except for next month, which will be the second, when, second Wednesday. It's the 14th. And uh, Senator Molly Kelly will be coming to talk about um, the legislature and what's going on in Concord. Um, a couple of quick announcements before we continue on. Um, our breakfast forums are currently being um, sponsored by the Mananoc Radio Group. They're about to come to their, the end of their reign, um, but they are still continuing. Um, we will make some announcements later about some upcoming events. Uh, please be aware that Bill Rill is behind us um, from Eastern Video, and he'll be videoing, and um, hopefully we will, Greg, right, you'll be on TV. Um, our speaker this morning is Greg Tewksbury. Most of you know Greg is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Savings Bank of Walpole. He assumed that title in, at the end of 2007 when his predecessor retired. Um, he's been with the Savings Bank of Walpole since 2005, and prior to that he was the Chief Financial Officer for Miriam Graves. Um, you might be interested to know Greg is a native of Claremont, New Hampshire. Uh, he attended the Whittemore School of Business and Economics and just told me he loves economics um, at the University of New Hampshire and is a CPA. Um, so, without further ado, I will introduce to you Greg, whose topic this morning is federal banking le legislation. Thank you, Susan. Good morning, everyone. I've got a slide deck here. We'll go through it. We'll try to keep this informal. If you have questions or comments as we go along, please feel free to um, just blurt them out. It's an intimate group here. Um, I'm not sure why you're here this morning. This is a really, really boring subject um, for most. It's certainly not not, not for, for for me. And um, I was sharing with, with Denise um, earlier that I um, spent quite a bit of time over the last year and a half um, um, in Washington and, and actually in our state and capital, um, talking about banking. As we have some bankers here, um, it's been important for our voices to be heard um, in, uh, as community banks for sure, but I think as an industry. Um, I'm one of these advocates that don't, doesn't spend a lot of time differentiating ourselves right now as community banks and the large banks, uh, because what's happening on Capitol Hill as we speak, literally as we speak, the conference um, committees are, are meeting between the House and the, and the Senate Committee and the Senate um, on passing um, one of the largest pieces, or I will say it will be the largest piece of banking legislation that we've seen um, in our history. I'm mean, going back to the Great Depression. What's coming out over the next couple of weeks um, will impact um, us, it'll impact you um, for, for the foreseeable future. So that's why I'm here. I'll talk to you a little bit about that and what it does mean to, to your local banks um, and, and perhaps the community banks around the country. Um, wh why are you here? <laughs> I, I really am I'm, I'm curious. It's like, oh, if I would have saw this um, in some of the, the chamber press, I'm not sure that I would have got up so early, and, although I'm an early bird anyways, but um, but made my way here. So uh, I'm curious if this, I mean, it's nice that you're up. Yeah. Well, obviously, as you pointed out, there's some momentous change coming. And uh, if you have the courage to come tell us all about it and explain how it's going to work, you certainly tell me to you the uh, courtesy of coming and listening. Oh, great. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Well, um, some of my comments, um, um, please take them um, from me personally, not necessarily from the bank. Um, I do have a piece of, of literature to, to, to send along with you. It's um, we put out, we have put out over the last couple of years, it's a management's view of the continuing um, financial crisis. It is a, it is a really um, deep read. It's something you don't want to start at 9 o'clock at night if you're a little drowsy, unless you have insomnia <laughs> because it will. Um, but it's, it, it's, it's really an economics piece. Um, it talks about um, 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 the, some of the responses to the financial crisis and, and our opinions on it and, and how, uh, how it's impacting our industry. and and we think the consumers and perhaps the country, perhaps the world, as, as we still have 48% uh, of the GDP um, coming out of the United States. So all those things are in here, and, and, and feel free to read it. But the comments are not meant to be political. So I'll put that out there. Um, um, I'm, I don't mind saying, I'm right down, I'm an I. And as a bank president, I'm supposed to be that big R. I'm, I'm not. I, I, I'm, fiscal, I'm fiscally conservative, I'll tell you that. So my comments may come across as being political. They're, they're really not. 
um, they are to support my industry and my industry and the economics um, um, world that I think um, supports um, the foundation of, of, of the strength of our economy. So if they if they come across anywhere different any way different than that, I apologize in advance because that's not that's not my intent. Um, you know, where are we going and what are the impacts of banks? That's what I'm going to try to talk about um, this, this morning. I don't use notes, so I'll, I, I'll tend to go all over the place. But. There's all those three by five cards. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> I don't even, they're not here. You can't read this all uh, back there. I, I apologize. but um, um, And this is going to sound political, but it's really not. But this, uh, my opinion is, now how did we get here? And I think it's important to spend 10 minutes just talking about how I thought we got here, because if you've got sweeping legislation, that's going to impact us. Just some, some, some framework as to, uh, my opinion, um, how we got here. And I believe there's, there's a few things that got us in this mess. We are clearly in an economic mess. You know, this great recession we're in is real. Um, I think every day we're, we're fearful that we're going to double dip. Um, I personally am in that camp. I'm kind of a downer. I'll leave it, I have a lot of coffee and you'll be, you know, at least awake and, and juice when you leave here because. Um, I, I, I tend to be a, a little bit of a, on the negative side of the economy right now, but um, public policy, um, I think, it was probably the number one contributor in terms of how we got here. Um, what do I mean by that? Um, this is home ownership rates. Um, you can't see this. This is 1965, okay? And it goes right up through um, um, about 2011, but it's not there, 2010. Um, home ownership rates. Um, and, and, and this country, and we can go back to the 40s and 30s. Well, following 1930, when we when we had Fannie Mae and came out of came out of the recession, we saw our home ownership rates get up to the 60 percent level. In 1965, you see this gradual decline. That's when we introduced Freddie Mac, the sister of Fannie Mae. Um, we had um, um, it is great for banks because we can unload our mortgages and we can put them to, to Fannie and Freddie. And, and free up our balance sheets to continue to do what we need to do in the community and lend money. And so there was a gradual increase from the 63, 60, up to 66. Um, this is the early 80s, pretty tough time um, in, 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 in the economy and real estate. And then we leveled out at the 64% level um, for, for over a decade. That's sustainable home ownership, okay? That's 63 to 65%, the average of 64% um, is sustainable home ownership. We had public policy, and this is true. We started at the end of Reagan, you know, went with Bush, went with Clinton, came with another Bush, and has continued on, where we believe that it is a right for people to own a home in this country. I think it's admirable. I really do. I'm a banker. I want to lend money for, for mortgages. But that public policy created a lot of problems, okay? And we got up to home ownership rates that exceeded 69%. 2006 into 2007, um, people couldn't afford homes, okay? And so we've got blame that we can fill this room with names of, of companies, with individuals, with politicians, with, with credit rating agencies, all kinds of blame to go around. But the reality is we had, we had documented public policy that says we want to raise home ownership rates in this country. And it became a Problem. That's my my opinion as to um, th that's the facts. Um, what were some of the accelerants in terms of this home ownership rate? Well, we had um, monetary policy during the 2000s. It's been great to have be a mortgage, not so, so so great to be a saver. Okay, because you're not earning anything on your CDs or your savings accounts, um, but you're um, you're getting these wonderful rates. And Greenspan followed by um, um, Dr. Bernanke. Um, that's the key have kept interest rates at a very, very low level. I mean, we're meeting today. We're going to the Federal Open Market Committee will come out of their two-day meeting today and tell us that um, they're going to keep interest rates from zero to 25 basis points for the extended, you know, a future. Despite the G20 meeting up in Canada saying, "Stop stimulating the economy, of the United States. We're all taking these austerity measures in the rest of the world that stop stimulating. We're going to keep interest rates at a very low rate. It's great." And Susan asked me. <laughs> Where's the 10-year rates right now? Um, four and a quarter, maybe four and a half. Um, very low rates. I mean, we've all seen rates. 1965 rates. Yeah. Right? And, but we've all seen them, you know, in the, in the 16, 17, 18 percent rate, right? Um, not that that's good. I mean, that's, that's inflation um, um, fighting um, rates, but... Um, Greg, curiosity. Yeah. Uh, do, do 
do you believe that the um, tax incentive for uh, a deduction for homeownership um, is also part of this public policy issue? It, I mean, um, countries like Canada that, that, that have a, a real estate um, 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 debacle uh, doesn't doesn't offer that as a tax incentive to deduct your interest on real estate. Um, yeah, I mean that certainly contributes to it. If we didn't have that incentive, people would think twice about home ownership versus um, um, versus uh, renting. But yeah, it, it's got some. I'm not sure that's a critical one. I, mean, I love the deduction, but but you're right. Anyone who owns a house loves the deduction. It's an accelerant. You know, Fannie and Freddie. Um, I know I know several executives from Fannie and Freddie um, that that worked there during these heydays, and they will tell you, um, probably on the QT, I'm telling you, uh, the public. Um, that the pressure for them to loosen their underwriting standards in the mid-2000s was unbelievable. So, we were talking about some of the ratios, right, the 36, 28, all of these ratios that we're supposed to, we grew up saying, if I don't have this much in income, um, I can't afford that. I need this debt-to-income ratio, I need this loan-to-value ratio. Um, the pressure that was put on these executives at Fannie and Freddie, Fannie and, and Freddie uh, a government-sponsored enterprise, GSE, um, was to relax these underwriting standards, and they did. Okay, um, we had we had companies. All we're, we're just you know we're middlemen, okay, middle people. Um, you know we, we we underwrite a mortgage and we sell it off, and somebody else packages us up, um, and, um, and and sells it off. We had um, my next slide. Yeah, um, non the, the non bank credit that came that came around. Um, you know, in the 2000s, um, and um, what do we mean by non-bank credit? Um, mortgage companies, um, the GMACs, the leasing companies. I mean, if you've gone to get a, a loan or, or a lease for a car at your automobile um, dealership, oftentimes you were dealing with who? Red carpet lease, GMAC. You weren't dealing with your local bank or credit union. In many cases, <coughs> the industry changed. How did it change? <coughs> From 1960 to 2008, this was the amount of bank credit that was extended. Okay, it went up. It went up from you know the four trillion, you know, up into the you know just under ten trillion, nine trillion dollars. You know, so over those uh, 40 year period, quite a bit of credit was extended. Okay, this was the this was the non bank credit that was extended. Okay, the mortgage companies, I I'm not dissing them. I mean, they, they were doing their job as a I'm a, I'm a free market person, I'm a capitalist. Hey, if the market was there and you can make a few bucks, you know, go for it. But the reality is, I'm gonna get back to the topic, legislation and why, um, and what, what, we're, what we're gonna be dealing with in terms of coming out of, coming out of um, on the capital uh, for legislation. Um, it, it wasn't traditional banking um, that fueled, um, you know, this, uh, this asset bubble in real estate. So. Um, so we had, um, I, I, before that, talk about, I think there was a misunderstanding of our credit in real estate. Okay. Um, the smartest people um, in, in, in the world coming out of the best MBA programs uh, were putting together models um, to capture the risks of real estate. They were, they were putting in tranches, right, they had these um, CDOs, these collateralized debt obligations, and these really, really fancy mortgage tax securities, and they were out buying insurance from these these companies and and, and, and wrapping them around them, and, and Sanders and Ford and Moody said, "Oh, this is good stuff. Yep, you've, you've got 105 percent loan to value on these properties, and people with credit scores that typically wouldn't wouldn't even be able to get a checking account, but um, but we 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 understand the risks." And we put them in these tranches, and we've got them with this A paper over here, and um, and we've got it together, and we understand it. And the models suggest that they'll be fine. The investors will be fine. Remember, what were you getting on your savings accounts in 2006? Not much. One. Okay. One percent. So what people, what were people looking for? What were corporations looking for? To put on their balance sheet something with a little more yield, right? Mortgage-backed securities were a wonderful thing, even if they were only at four percent, five percent heck of a lot better than they were getting in, in some corporate bonds or others. So, so but we, as long as we've captured the risk, as long as the rating agency said we're fine, okay, and, and we were selling 
and, 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 and people were refinancing, everybody was getting into home. You go from 64% to 69%, doesn't sound like a lot. When you take it over, you know, 300 million people in this country, 5% um, increase in home ownership, that's a lot of dollars put into the system, in the, in the investment. Um, so the reality is, you blew it. Okay? The models were wrong. The assumption was that you could always refinance your property and get out of a problem. Okay? Because real estate prices always go up. The models didn't go back far enough. These kids didn't have enough memory to go back far enough to say that, oh, well, what happens if? It just doesn't happen, right? So we've got public policy driving a desired outcome. We've got models and very, very bright kids putting together um, um, strategies and, and ways of capturing what they thought was the risk. And we all bought it. We bought it. Same as Mega Walpole bought um, instruments where we lost money on because we thought the risk was captured. We were wrong. So um, it led to a panic. Okay, a panic in the credit markets. Really, banking 101, and most of you probably know this, but um, when we talk about credit freezing up, remember 2008, holy smokes, we got together, we, you know, Congress was convened, there was this big powwow with Hank Paulson at the time, and, and, and President Bush, and, um, and they brought in, um, was Obama there? Not yet. Um, and they had um, um, Ben Bernanke, and they had, at the, the time, the governor, um, for the, uh, the Board of Governors from New York, um, um, Timothy Geithner, and they got together and said, what do we do? Holy smokes, the credit markets are freezing up. They weren't talking about you getting credit from your local bank. They were talking about banks lending to one another. What we do at the end of the day, we settle our bank, just like your stores, you settle up. If you a little short, you go to the bank, maybe draw in a line of credit. If you get a little bit extra, you go deposit it into your bank account, right? We do the same thing in banks. It's called Fed funds. So we borrow. If we're a little short at the end of the day, oh, had a good day of lens, loans or deposit outflow, and we need, we're a little short, um, we go to other banks and we borrow money to settle our position. If we get extra, boy, deposits just flowing today, a lot of loan payoff, and um, we'll sell that to other banks. And so overnight, um, this whole banking market around the world is buying and selling funds from one another. That's the way it works, okay? When the market, when we panicked, said, oh my gosh, we don't know what that other bank has in their balance sheet for these toxic assets, right? These collateralized debt obligations, these mortgages, are these banks going to fail? No way in hell am I going to sell my funds to another bank that may fail overnight because it's unsecured. We're talking millions and billions and trillions of dollars. You know, millions for a little <coughs> bank like, like say, the Bank of Walpole. Billions for, for the larger players, the Wall Street banks, okay? Every night. And so when you don't, when, when, you, when, you're, when you're afraid of, of, of selling and buying, um, um, the Treasury, and the Fed, the Fed steps in and says, oh, we have to convene and free up the markets. We have to open up facilities and stuff like that. So we've got to get this credit flowing. Most consumers say, get credit flowing, yeah, because I just got turned down from a loan at the bank. That's not what they're referring to. They're talking about the broader scheme of, of getting credit going. So that was happening. Um, we, we, we got bank failures. We had, you know, the, the, all of a sudden, the, the housing market starts crashing. Um, we had... Um, the equity market. We saw the you know the stock markets just take a, a, a you know a dive during that time. What we lost 50% of the value in, in, in less than a year. Unemployment goes up to near teetering 10%, percent nine seven today or something like that. You know, calling the Great Recession. Um, this is the bank failures. Okay, this is 2008. Um, okay, we had 25 bank failures. 2009, Yikes. 140. Okay, and this is this is little. This is a few weeks old. This is a little dated. This. This is 2009. We're actually at 83 as of last Friday. Um, FDIC predicts we'll probably lose more banks in 2010 than we did in 2009. I'm not sure how much greater than that 140. Um, but every um, so that you may, I mean, and so you may see if you get AB news bites or something from um, um, some of our trade associations every Monday morning. Okay, you, you go there. Okay, which banks failed over the weekend? I just don't want one local. Okay, we had one in Lowell, that was the closest. Um, Do they tend to be a certain kind of bank? It's just all over the board? It's all over, I mean, especially back in, in, in this period, you know, when we had you know, Washington Mutual, right. you know, one of the largest thrifts, the largest thrift, um, go down. Um, but most of them would be considered community banks, small banks, probably something with assets under $10 billion. <laughs> um, doesn't sound, that sounds like a lot. 
But those are small banks when you're talking with, you know, Citigroup at two trillion. You know, 10 billion on two trillion, that, that, that's a pretty small percentage. Um, FDIC um, um, comes out with a watch list, a problem loan list. Those are, those are banks that's not published because you wouldn't put your money there if you knew your bank was a problem loan list. And all, no, I can tell you there's no problem loan list and, and uh, no problem banks in the answer. Um, but um, um, they're up to 10% of all banks right now. So 10%, we have, we have 8,200 banks. You get 10 percent, it's a, and we know the number. It's 780, 785 problem banks. When they publish that number quarterly, um, historically, if you become a problem bank, you'll fail. The FDIC believes as long as we don't have a double dip recession, you know, we'll probably only have 150, 160 banks fail this year. If we have a double dip recession, all bets are off. So that's that's kind of where we are economically. I'm getting back to. Why, we're, why we need some, and perhaps legislation. Um, What's a normal, non-problematic year? Failures. We're a a couple. Oh, we, we went we went five years with no bank failures. Okay. All right. Yeah. So this this is dramatically dramatically different. Yeah. <coughs> Frank, is this attributed to the fact that smaller banks um, uh, move their assets to, to the secondary market? Does that contribute to their failure? No, in fact, that would be the opposite because once once they get moved to the secondary market, right. there's no risk retention. Um, it's it has to do with most of the classic example of, of, of these banks and these these um, 83 banks that have failed this year. The vast majority of them were well capitalized over the last couple of years, meaning they have plenty of capital, meaning you have plenty of money in your bank account. You took significant risks in lending, and it's not it's not the classic. People think, oh, banks take on excessive risk because they lend. Banks take on excessive risk because what we call interest rate risk, meaning that we, we will um, we'll bring in all of this money from, from deposits and lend it out in 30-year fixed rate mortgages. That's great as long as interest rates don't go up. And you have to replace all of those savings accounts that you were paying 1% now at 8%. 0.75. Yeah, 0.75. So now, if you have to pay at eight percent on those deposits, and you've got all these fixed rate mortgages that you're receiving five percent on, you're out of business. That's the risk in bank, and that's what we manage every day. Um, but these banks failed because, um, in parts of the country, they got into construction and development lending. Okay, not not through traditional business loans. They got into development loans. And if, if anyone's gone out to Henderson, Nevada, or has been to the, the outside <laughs> out, outskirts of, of Atlanta, Georgia, um, you see these. Sprawling, sprawling developments. I mean, thousands and thousands of homes. Okay, um, you know, areas much larger than than Keene. In some areas, as large as probably the Mananoc region, just with new developments. And these smaller banks, what a way to earn a lot of money. You're not going to lose. People will sell their house. We'll get paid back. Well, those houses never got finished, and the banks failed. Weren't there any voices of warning, or weren't they taken seriously in the couple of years leading up to? If you look at the, um, um, in every bank failure, um, the, the, the regulators are required to do a post-mortem. So what did we, what could we have learned to help us in future exams? And in all cases, you know, the flashing lights are going off. And, you know, I'm not just an examiner, but they, they just didn't, they, they, they missed it. And, and these people are banks. They did. So, um, if I'm, in, if, I'm, if I'm a congressperson, right, and I'm looking at this stuff saying, my gosh, we need some regulatory reform because, you know, we're all losing money in our, in our retirements and, and, and we have taxpayer money on the line for, for, for some of this. Um, I, I will tell you, and I'm, this, this is going to be a slam at our current president, but it's only because it was um, a video that I just saw two days ago. Um, and he's, um, he's, he's with his, some of his cabinet members around and he said, we will not allow our our tax insured deposits, our taxpayer fund funded insurance to be at risk anymore. And we need this FINREC, financial regulatory reform. And I'm asking, you know, my my, my Congress people to pass it, you know, the next couple of weeks because no longer are we going to put taxpayers' money at risk for deposit insurance. I can tell you that in the history of the FDIC, taxpayers' money has never been used to fund an insurance fund. We, the 
banks fund it. Okay? We get assessed every quarter to fund that insurance fund. It's never been a taxpayer issue. It's been a bank issue. But that comes out of our pocket. So it's just, sometimes we can, we can embellish things. Sometimes there's a misunderstanding. And it says Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. I think it's a government agency. It's a private corporation that's funded by, by the banks that use that as insurance. I'm of the opinion, I don't think we should have insurance. You're saying, wait a minute, how am I going to put the money in your bank? Go find a bank that is run responsible and put your money there and, and not have any insurance. And you, you, you see some changing risk behaviors in terms of how people operate their bank. Now, the government's not going to allow that to happen because, holy smokes, you know, have constituents that lose money if the bank fails. But how, to that question, how would somebody who isn't familiar with the balance sheet of a, of a bank yep. really understand who's responsible and who's not? There, there, there are um, companies out there that rate us. Yeah, and they rated a lot of toxic banks. Well, <laughs> uh, some of those banks didn't get very good ratings, quite frankly. Yeah. Yeah, but you're right. I mean, that's the, is the average person really going to know? I think we could get there. I think we could, there, there are measures. <coughs> you, you, you have no idea how the Savings Bank of Walpole, Connecticut River, um, Ontario County Credit Union is rated, right? Because right? it's not no public. Idea. It's not. It can't be. And they say it can't be because if, if we were rated poorly, you'd take your money out. I'm like, put my rating out there. Okay? okay? I want people because it's, we're, we're, we're operating, and all of us here, um, are operating in our institutions in a safe and sound manner. If, if, if other banks aren't, they shouldn't have the deposits. Craig, I have a question for you. Yep. As far as, you know, I mean, the mortgage lending and so forth, I mean, how did Savings Bank of Walpole protect itself? I mean, I, you guys do third-year mortgages, but you don't do them, you don't retain them in house. So right. is that some of the security for a smaller bank because you do up to 10-year loans, but you do have your own other working guidelines yep. versus the no-income, no-asset, which didn't make any sense when you If you um, if you underwrote those and sold them, you really didn't have any risk. Mm -hmm. And that's some of the legislation. You know, do, do banks have to retain some of that risk so they have skin in the game? Right. Okay. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll comment on why that's not a good idea. But <laughs> um, um, I think the community banks that, that I'm aware of, the ones in, in, in this state, okay, and most most New England, we never deviated from our underwriting requirements, mm -hmm. whether we sold it or held or held it in, in, in house. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for a period of time, we, we held on to all of our 15-year mortgages. So we got the skin in the game, and that's a, that's a big, big piece of our portfolio. And some interest rate with that, so we hedged that on the other side of the balance sheet and different things. But um, um, when I, I joined the bank um, in the middle of 2005, and what an eye-opener. I was in banking, I, I spent 10 years with CFX here in town. And when, and when we sold it um, to People's Heritage, I went and did some non-banking stuff and cleared my my, my mind for a while um, of banking and, and, um, and got back into it in 2005, seven years later. And the, the industry had dramatically changed. And at the time, our senior lender, um, um, Scott Laughing House, um, I remember I wasn't at the bank um, three or four weeks before I was called on by three brokers, mortgage brokers. And again, they were doing their job and, and God bless them for, for making some money during the market that allowed them to. They called on me and said, Greg, um, Great, welcome back into banking. Um, if you're in this this in, in this this world, bankers don't change. They change your uniforms often, okay? But it's the same people. So I get back in the bank and the phone starts ringing. Hey, um, uh, we want we want we want to buy all of your turndowns. What do you mean a turndown? Okay. And he said, well, you know, if you can't make a loan to somebody, um, you know, refer us, refer them to us. You know, we maybe even pay you a, a referral fee and. And we'll take care of that customer. Like, okay, that's, that's interesting. You know, people want to take you out to dinner, they want to take you out to lunch, talk to you about how they can take care of your customers if we can't take care of them. And I remember sitting down with Scott and said, we're not taking care of our customers if we refer them to these folks. Are we doing them? Oh, once in a while. No, we're not. We're done. We are absolutely done referring our customers to somebody else because we're not helping them. If, we can't, if, if they can't afford a mortgage, they can't afford a mortgage. And it's just, and it was old school, and 
some of the lenders didn't like me because when we started creating a little form and this is what you need to do in order to qualify for a conventional mortgage and we think it's in your best interest to do that, blah, blah, blah. So we didn't, and I think most banks, traditional community banks, you know, fell into that category. The problem was, in 2005, 2006, somebody would come in and, and well, God, what do you mean a stingy, conservative, old school bank, and they go down next door and boom, get a mortgage, great. Oh well. 100%. So we are in for a lot, a lot of trouble. So I think that's what, and most banks kind of held to those standards. So if they did get into it, they sold it, and it ended up in some mortgage back or CDO, um, and somebody else's balance sheet. Unless you bought it back in your own investment portfolio. Some of us. Yeah. Um, what, what happened to all this stuff? It led to bailouts. Okay. So in, in September, in September of 2008, we had the 787, the infamous um, bailout bill. What was that bailout bill? It was going to buy toxic acids. Um, it was going to go into banks and to, to, to uh, uh, free up this liquidity, right? But we're going to take some of these awful assets off the banks, not off the books of, of the larger banks. And, um, and that's what that $800 billion. They try to figure out how they were doing that, how to, how to do that, and they couldn't price them. But we don't know if it's 50 cents on the dollar. The banks are saying, well, heck, a lot more than that. I'm holding these to maturity, and you know the cash flows over time are going to be a lot more than that. Because they couldn't price it. So then they renamed it, right? What, what did they rename it? TARP, right? Troubled Asset Relief Program. And what that money was used for, and what became known as the bailout, OK? People, it was infused into banks, um, a lot of arm twisting out there, ladies and gentlemen. Um, um, but like, I'm not sure Gary got his arm twisted. I got my arm twisted. Okay, FDIC, take TARP. No way. Now we think that it would be a good idea for all banks, because they didn't want in individual banks that took it be singled out as perhaps being problematic. So we want every bank to take it. Oh please, you know, Greg, you really should. No, thank you. I don't want to be subject to have them run my bank like everyone else. If being told how to run the bank, so um, TARP came and it created this, this, this um, um, public outcry. Okay, of what do we do? I mean, we're bailing out the banks. Okay, the money has actually TARP has made a lot of money for for, for your government. Okay, has been paid back um, with with tremendous tremendous um, dividends because part of the TARP, if you took TARP. Um, as a mutual bank, it was a little difficult, difficult for us because we can't issue them stock. We don't have stock. We don't, we don't have owners. Um, but for stock banks, they had to issue them warrants. And what happened was, in 2008, the value of these, the stock for, for, for these publicly held um, um, financial institutions was way down. Okay? So they were issued warrants, kind of like a stock option. Okay? And then as things recovered, the government sold them and made a killing. Okay, so it's returned to your taxpayers a lot of money through the TARP program, but it's still got a bad name. So, you know, Congress says, well, what do we, what do? We do? Um, we've got public, public outcry. Um, and that, that's why we have legislation, right? I mean, that's just the way it works. Um, you've got, you've got um, um, a need uh, to be responsive to your constituents, and the constituents are out there saying, wait a minute, I'm out of a job, right? Seven or Seven and a half million people lost jobs. Um, I bought real estate, whether I bought it at the wrong time or not. You know, real estate is supposed to always improve. It didn't. Um, I'm being foreclosed on. I mean, just the public outcry. Um, banks, we've got bullseyes around us. You know, that, that we don't have rooms big enough to put a bullseye. That's fine. We're going to be tough-skinned about it. Um, and because there are some things that some banks did pretty, pretty poorly. Okay, and made some some bad judgments. Generally speaking, though, um, it, it wasn't just banks. It was a whole myriad of things that caused, caused us to be in the situation we are. So now we're going to have legislation um, to fix a problem that, that I'll get into now. Frank? Wasn't the justification for this too big to fail on these big banks? Yeah. I'm not sure they knew it at the time. Um, that, that That's why they were putting money into the banks. Um, but certainly when... Um, um, when, when, when Bear Stearns was one of the first ones, in March of 2008. Um, I remember that night very well because I'm, I'm at home on a Sunday night, 11 o'clock, you know, watching you know, CNBC and Bloomberg. Oh my gosh, I knew what was on my balance sheet at the bank. I knew what I had for bonds. I had a Bear Stearns 
two bonds, a million dollars invested, you know, and Bear Stern. I'm like, oh my God, and they were saved, okay? They were, they were bailed out, okay? Um, and so the Wall Street banks were. Um, Merrill Lynch, you know, the next day found a partner in Bank of America. Um, you know, a short while later, um, Lehman Brothers wasn't so lucky, okay? They determined for whatever reason they weren't too big to fail. Um, AIG then got the biggest infusion of TARP of anybody, you know, of 90 billion bucks. Um, and, um, and then the whole, you know, bank started failing. And then the question came up, you know, are banks too big to fail? Um, some banks. Yes. Yeah. I'm a true capitalist. You know what? If you take risk and you, and, and you lose, you die. Yeah. And that's just the way it is. <laughs> um, and if, so if, if we determine that there are, are whatever companies, whatever institutions are too big to fail, that's why we have antitrust. Right, Sam? I mean, we, have, we have antitrust. Bust them up. If they're posing true risks to the taxpayers of the country, then bust them up. Whether it's because of price issues, because of monopolies, or whether there's other inherent risks, that's why, that's why we have antitrust. Just, we do have laws in this country that says no bank can have more than 10% deposits. Okay? 10%. We, we've, got, we've got the top 50 banks that have 87 or percent of the deposits in the country. They're too big. They're too big. Um, and so, um, and that's why community banks really don't, we don't have a voice in, con in Congress. We try, knocking on the doors. I've met with, you know, Senator Shaheen and Greg you know, six times over the last year and a half, and, and our, and our Congresswoman, you know, Carol Shea Porter, and, and, and Congressman Hodes. And, and they, 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 they listen, they're sympathetic, they know what community banks are doing, they know the value of them, but we represent such a small piece of the, of the pie, and they've got big issues. So we have sweeping legislation coming at us. The President proposed legislation in June of 2009 for, for um, FINREG. Um, the House passed a 1,300-page bill at the end of last year. Um, the Senate was behind them in May um, with a 1,900-page um, bill. Um, they, there were very big differences between these two bills. They created a conference committee. That's how you go back to what, School of Rock or whatever it was and how a bill was formed and all you know, those jingles. Um, I'm being... Um, Some of us okay are here. Yeah. <laughs> maybe. maybe. Um, so we have a conference committee that was established um, 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 early this month, and they have a desire to have a bill passed. They want it on the con on the president's um, on desk to sign before they break the July Fourth holiday. Okay. Um, we're talking about legislation that is going to change you, the way that you you inter interact with banks, and the way that banks deliver services for the rest of our lives. Because things just don't go backwards quickly. Okay, once you, you live with them for a long time to figure out whether they're working or not, um, we believe that the process should be slow and deliberate, especially, you know, the, the sweeping legislation. It's not going to be. I mean, I'm, you know, following it. Night, I, I went in for about an hour and a half this morning into my office just to see what happened with the conference committee last night. And, and, and so some of, these, some of these will be a little bit dated. How am I doing that time? Um, uh, key provisions of bill. Um, um, the regulators are going to re receive more general authority um, to, to monitor everything in banks. I mean, that's a general statement. It concerns us when you have general statements in bills that said the regulators are going to have more authority. Okay, again, uh, more hands off, here, less government, blah, blah. blah. Um, but um, some of it's good. I mean, when we talk about complex securities, derivatives, they want to put them on an exchange, they want to follow these credit default swaps, these things that most of us have heard about, whether we understand them or not, I'm not sure I understand them all. Um, but they want to put them on exchanges, they want to trade them, they want to understand what the total you know, derivative risk is in the country. And that was the issue with AIG. We don't know this stuff called counterparty risk. What does that mean? That means that somebody else over there, if you do this, somebody else over there wins or loses. And we didn't have a way, a mechanism to really evaluate what all of that risk was. So we, we, had, we had to bail out AIG. That's, that's what I'm told, I, I really don't know. Um, uh, banks are going to afford, be forced to reduce debt that they have on their balance sheet and increase their capital levels. We don't know what those levels are going to be. We're on the edge of our seat, quite frankly. Um, we've got definitions in FDIC and, and the Office of Controller of Currency, if you're a national bank, um, NCUA, the National Credit Union, we have all these, these um, um, guidelines, not guidelines, there are laws that say you have to have a certain amount of capital in your bank to be considered to be well capitalized. 
10. We don't know how those are going to change, but they're going to change. Um, this is a big one. This, Frank, to your point, um, the government's going to be allowed, the Federal Reserve Bank is going to be allowed to seize a uh, collapsing um, institution. What happened with Lehman, they got together and said, no one's got jurisdiction. They were wondering whether there was a legal issue of who could take this thing down. Could they allow it to fail? No one, no one knew whether they had the, the, the authority to, to take it over. The FDIC says, well, it's not me. I don't, I don't oversee Wall Street banks. They don't have FDIC insurance funds. The Office of Control of Currency, and Jack Dugan said, um, Duggan said, it's not me. Um, Federal Reserve Bank says, well, that, you know, the holding company, yes, but not the, not the bank, it, not, not the Lehman Brothers themselves. So the, the, the legislation is going to define, and they've already and they've defined, it's going to be the Federal Reserve Bank um, under Ben Bernanke that's going to be able to have the jurisdiction to take these banks down if they need to. In the future. Consumer Protection Agency. This is our number one concern in terms of the bill right now. There's three main concerns you can hear me say. This is the biggest one for community banks. They, they're establishing um, a consumer protection, um, uh, consumer finance protection. If, if, if you're the House bill, it's an agency. If you're the Senate bill, it's a bureau. Um, but this consumer protection um, um, agency will be a separate and distinct agency. It won't be housed in the FDIC. Okay, our bank, we're, a, we're an FDIC in, 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 um, um, bank, meaning that they do our um, um, they regulate us. Um, for, for, um, um, uh, um, for credit union, it's the National Credit Union Association. They come in and they, you know, audit your books and, and, and really tear you apart and make sure you're doing everything according to the laws and regulation. And, um, you know, for, for Connecticut River Bank, it's um, the Office of Control of Currency, the OCC. Okay, so we all have different regulators. Um, but um, for, for our shop, the FDIC, this Consumer Protection Agency is going to be a separate and distinct um, agency. And they're going to have broad authorities. Now, the bill right now says, but if you're under $10 billion in assets, which is everybody here, they're not going to come in and audit you. Okay, so you're not going to be subject to their, to their review and audits. However, you're going to be subject to, if they have policy changes and reg changes, you're going to have to adopt them. Okay, but you don't, have to, you don't have to worry about them coming in and audit you, except for if they believe that you're not following them, then, then they have the jurisdiction to come in. The FDIC has a compliance division, and they have a safety and soundness division. Uh, division. The safety and soundness comes into making sure that your deposits are protected, that we're running the bank in a safe and sound manner so that we're not going to go out of business and subject your deposits that are over the FDIC insurance limit to loss. Okay, that's what they come in, and that's what they give us a rating. In. And they are tough. In addition, they come in and look at um, consumer protection. All these regulations, and it's an alphabet soup, okay? And they go from A to Z. Um, and um, you know, our, our, our attorneys that deal with mortgage, mortgage, they know all the regulations. They come in and make sure that that APR that you have on your on, on your mortgage is the right, is calculated properly, and we're doing everything to make sure that that's correct. It has nothing to do with safety and sound. They want to make sure that we're freeing up your deposits on a timely basis. Okay, Rex CC says, we have to make your deposits available to you to withdraw within a certain number of days. Okay. So they come in and look at that. They come in and look at whether we're being responsible citizens. Okay, community reinvestment. Are we lending, taking these deposits in the communities we're doing business with, and lending them back to low and moderate income people who are required to have a certain percentage of our loans, whether that's good, bad, or indifferent, but we have, to, we have to lend them back to low and moderate income. We have to document that. And we get examined. That's consumer protection. This agency is going to be a different one. They're going to want to make sure that we're doing things that are in the consumer's best interest. Okay? Um, I'm fine. I mean, uh, I'm not worried about it. What I don't know is how, how broad-based some of, their, the, some of these, these rules that they're going to develop um, um, Will, will impact over, over time. Our biggest concern, quite frankly, is that we're going to be forced to operate in the same exact manner as Cheshire County Credit Union, Connecticut River Bank, Bank of America, J.P. Morgan. We're all going to be there. We're just going to be robotic in how we deliver our financial services because we're going to be put in such, such very tight boxes. And if we can't differ differentiate ourselves, quite frankly, and there's not a difference between a community bank and a, and a money center bank. That's our concern. And it's real. There's a lot written in this, in this document about that. The person that they've, that the, uh, that the president has 
consider while running this agency, um, a professor from Harvard, um, Elizabeth Warren, um, is, I don't mind putting this on, on, on the film, um, she's a bank hater. Absolutely despises banks. Thinks we've been crooks. Thinks that everything that we've done is in the, in, is in the consumer's um, worst interest. That our fee structure, that, that how we operate is with some intentional disregard for their best interest. And she's going to run this agency. That's going to, we're going to know that in a few weeks. What else is on this bill? This goes on for a little bit, so I'll, I'll um, um, we're going to consolidate regulated, re uh, regulatory bodies. Got, I mentioned OCC, the NCUA, we've got the FDIC, we've got um, and the OTS, and the Federal Reserve Board. Those are the, those are the entities, that the regulatory bodies. Um, the Office of Thrift and Supervision, the OTS, is going to go away. It's going to get consolidated into the OCC. Um, that has a lot of thrift concern about it. So, thrifts in this area, yeah. Lake Sunapee Bank, it's a thrift. Okay, they're going to have a new regulator. They don't know what that means to them. Okay, I can say that they're a publicly held company, but anybody following the regis legislation knows that they're going to have a different regulator. And, and they're, they're concerned. Even son is concerned about what that means to the shop. Um, limits on interchange fees. Okay, um, Senator Durbin um, is, is absolutely committed that, and if you're a merchant, you're smiling because what Visa and MasterCard charges, okay, that one to two percent on all those consumer transactions, um, that gets divvied up in a way. Um, it comes out of out of the merchant. They paid it, okay, and it goes back to MasterCard or Visa, um, and then they divvy it up. Some comes to us as the banks, okay. Some they keep some of it. Um, some of it goes to these third-party processors of, of, of these um, credit card, uh, debit card transactions, um, and what they're what they want is it's going to they're going to regulate how much banks can take of that, okay? And, and we're looking at um, probably a 75 to 80 percent um, reduction in our interchange fees um, for debit cards. It's not going to affect credit cards transactions, but debit card transactions, and it's going to it's going back to the merchants. Go back to the Walmarts and the Lowe's. Those are the two biggest um, lobbyists um, that, that won. I mean, last night they won. Um, and um, about 11 o'clock last night, they kind of stamped it and said, um, that's just going to happen. Let me tell you what that means. Um, for small banks, that's a big nut for us. What happens to the cost of me processing those? Nothing. We still have all the cost associated with providing you a debit card, okay, and the risks. If you, have a, if you have a fraudulent debit card transaction, you know who pays for that? We do. Okay, we eat that. As long as you tell us within 30 days. And let me tell you, the fraud out there on our, on our debit card is unbelievable. I mean, la last month alone, we wrote off over $15,000 in local, okay, Keene, New Hampshire debit card fraud. Okay? When you say fraud, that's me using Susan's to make a transaction. That's right. Taking it, I found it, however I got her card. Yeah. Or found, um, obtained a number some way. It wasn't through a safe bank of Walpole. It could have been from a merchant. There, there are machines and restaurants that some kids use to get your numbers, okay? And all the information on your mag strip, okay? And they'll go use that. Not, not, not locally. These were used in Puerto Rico, Oregon, California and Florida. Okay, so it was last week. So it was they don't sell. They actually go and use the cards. They use the information. They create their own cards. Okay, and they go and use them. You know, so the customer calls us. You know, I've got these a thousand dollars that I didn't know was on my, my account. Okay, we look at it. We have to give them the provisional credit. We look at it. Eventually, we credit. We require it, which is fine. But we, we so we put that back in their account, and then we work with authorities to try to get it back. So we use this interchange fee to accept some of the risks of offering those cards. Many banks have um, rewards programs. Okay, that's what we that we use some of those those interchange fees to pay for those reward programs as an incentive. Um, um, that money is now going to come out of the banking system. Okay. So that means that the whole system, will, the debit system, will change. It will absolutely. In terms of, it has, to. it has to change. It has to change because we don't have the funds coming into the banking business. Um, to support, are we going to have debit cards? Yeah, we have to have debit cards. I mean, you're not, you're, 
you're not going to go and open up a checking account at a bank if they don't offer that service. So we're just going to have to find a different way for you to pay for it. Does the bank have insurance for, for no. these losses? <coughs> no. I mean, not, not for those types of, no. Yeah, we have, yeah, we have fidelity bonds and errors and omissions and things like that. I mean, the but not for that. Cuts. No. And there's no no underwriter that's ever going to take on that no. that risk. So um, that's that's part of the bill. Um, elimination of capital. There are certain types of capital that banks are, that have used, untraditional. I'm, I'm not a, a necessarily a supporter of it, but they could issue debt, and if it's got characteristics of capital, um, it was considered capital for meeting some of those minimum um, um, guidelines. Um, this bill is going to strip that away. Um, they probably will grandfather what's on the books, but they won't allow you to um, 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 add capital in that way. The only way you're going to have the capital, if you're public, you issue stock, or you earn it. Um, you can't issue this subordinated debt and call it capital for these provisions. What that does is shrinks the industry. So we're saying, okay, great. We're, we're going through a period of time where we're trying to lend, we're trying to be responsive, we're trying to help as financial institutions get us out of this mess, uh, economic mess, and you're shrinking. You're, you're shrinking the industry by, by removing this capital. So that's in the bill. That's going to happen. Um, lower lending limit for state banks. Um, if you're a state member bank, um, right now um, we can lend up to 15% of our capital. Um, some of those, uh, that based on the type of bank that you are, they're going to lower those um, down to probably 10, 12 percent. So the average loan, the largest loan that you can that you can offer in, from your bank is going to be a little bit lower. Unfair, deceptive, and abusive practices. UDEP is very broad. It's always been there. We are we are prohibited for doing anything that's considered unfair, deceptive, and abusive. Okay, you want hopefully you want to do business with us if you if, if we. There's some broad language that allows the regulators to shut banks down, to fine them, um, if they consider them to have a very, very broad. Under the current UDEP provisions, they specifically that these are unfair, deceptive, and abusive. What they're going to do is give this to the new Consumer Protection uh, Bureau and say that if you generally think that a bank is doing something that's considered um, unfair, deceptive, and abusive, um, you can find them, you can, um, and it's just, we don't like operating with such general guidelines because you're at the whim of the regulator that comes in. And there are differences from one exam to another within the same agency. It depends on whether the, the kid's trying to get a notch in their belt or whether they're getting different directive from, from, from Washington in terms of do we need to come down hard or do we try to loosen up a little bit. So we're concerned about that. That's in the current um, bill. Um, Tremendous amount of additional disclosure requirements. You've already seen some of them, okay? And your credit card uh, bills, if you've seen them, tells you how many years it's going to take to pay this off if you do the minimum payment. Um, um, and banks, we're going to have a tremendous amount of additional disclosure requirements. We already have them in some mortgages. So I think this is the last one for the bill. Um, pre preemption restrictions for national banks. Gary's not going to be happy man this morning because it was approved last night. Preemption is... If you operate in, in, in um, more than one state, like Connecticut River, who's got operations in, in, in Vermont and New Hampshire, okay, um, preemption gave the uh, federal regulator, in that case the OCC, um, the ability to preempt individual state statutes on consumer protection so that they can apply a very consistent approach within their bank on how they how they deliver their services, their disclosures, how they treat their customers, all the stuff that consumer protection. Um, last night, it was um, um, overruled, you know, the, um, the preemption for 2004 that was out there. They overruled it and said, every state's going to have their own jurisdiction for consumer protection. So if Vermont's got a different set of standards in New Hampshire, you're going to have to comply differently in each state. And they don't care if you're Bank of America, you're going to have 50 different, um, diff different um, um, laws to a, a, a statutes to, to comply with. Um, ability to repay. Um, um, this is this is absolutely coming um, as part of this bill. We're going to have to demonstrate, and it's a good thing. Okay, we're going to have to demonstrate. It's a good thing in one aspect. Okay, um, that the customer has the ability to repay their mortgage. How about that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> How about those thirty-six twenty-eights? You know, just you know, eighty percent LTV, or you have to buy private mortgage insurance, or you now the basic under. But we now our files. The scary <coughs> thing about this is 
So if we have to demonstrate, we have to document why, I mean, for us, okay, I'll just take our basic underwriting um, um, guidelines and our, and our documentation, and it will demonstrate the ability to repay. The problem is, is if um, the person two years from now, three years from now, they lose their job, whatever, they have the ability to come back and sue the bank now, saying, I don't have the ability to repay. You should have, you should have known that the industry I was working in is under tough times, I'm being laid off. So we believe, as an industry, Lori's going to have a field day coming after us with the ability to repay. It, 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 and it's that general. The, the law is going to say banks have the, and mortgage companies have the responsibility to document the, their, their customers' ability to repay this mortgage. Period. For the life of the mortgage. Right. I mean, it, just does, it doesn't, doesn't have a life frame. You've got a 30-year mortgage. I, now, there's going to be case law developed and all that over time, and, and we'll have more framework in time to uh, deal with that field. Um, great deal of restrictions coming for publicly held company, companies from compensation, how, how they compensate their, their um, senior management. Um, and if all banks, including the small banks of, of, of you know, we're, we're just under 300 million, that's a really tiny bank, you know, about the same size as the Connecticut River in, in the scheme of things. So. Um, we have to document our board. We're having to study. I'm going to pay thousands of dollars if a consultant come in and tell us that you know I'm being paid fair and that the bank is not providing a compensation package for to me and my senior management team that um, um, puts the bank at excess creates excess risk for the bank. Okay, we have to document that. We have to have an outside person come in tell us that yes, based on how we're being compensated, there's there's no excess risk being. Um, 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 enticed through a compensation plan for Savings Bank of Walpole. Um, directors um, are going to have to go through a complete whole new thing to, to become part of a, a, a publicly held bank. Clawbacks, meaning that if you get if you get a bonus, it's going to be up to three years that they can claw that go and, and grab that back if, if something happens in your in your financial institution down the road. The problem is, as you know, I don't. This isn't sour grapes. It's not meant to be. It's just. Um, it's going to be hard to attract really, really high quality people to run very complicated businesses with some of these restrictions. Who am going to say the heck of that? Um, I just, I'll go do something else because the risks are, are, are too high. Um, a lot of burdens on small business loans, the documentation, whether you're going through the SBA, there's a whole, whole section, a part of both of these, the Senate and, and the House bills on um, additional, um, I say, burdens on. on documentation and, um, and the ability to repay. I guess it's fine, but it, it's, it's there. Charter elimination. Um, they're trying to get rid of the thrift charter. And then the OTS I mentioned about the Office of Thrift, thrift and Supervision. Um, there's, there's some concern about um, eliminating the mutual charter okay, through this bill. They just don't have to deal with the, the remaining you know, 689 mutual banks that they have in the country. Okay? We got, we're quirky. Okay? We're, we're, we're deposit our own. What does that mean? How do we regulate that? If we tell you to, that you need to go get capital, you don't have the way to go get capital. So we just got to shut you down. Because we don't have stock, we just have to earn our way out of it. And so the concern about, you know, do they have to have a, do they want to maintain a whole separate set of, of guidelines and regulations for a, a very small group? Um, 589 or 689 banks, yeah, it's a big number, and there's only 8,200 banks, so as a percentage, it's up there. We represent, I don't know, 2% of the assets in the banking business. It's tiny. Really, really small. We're considered a large mutual at 300 million. <laughs> a lot of them are 100 million, 50 million. Why do you think they're going as quickly as they are? Why, why are they rushing the process versus, you know, doing an analysis? Not analysis, paralysis, but yep. you know, a, a more reasonable time frame in analysis. Well, what, what's, what's behind that? What's There's no way that legislation like this would get through probably the next Congress. Once we get to November and have some change. Oh, because 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 of the political change. The that's my that's my, my potential. Okay. There, there's a public outcry, public saying I've been I've been hurt, my, you know, and 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 I want response. I want I want those to pay. I need you know tighten up this. Banks need to be regulated because gosh, they just did some bad things. So that's that's part of it. Um, but I think the timing, their window is if they're going to get this sweeping legislation through, it's it's. That quick. I mean, they have to they have to get it done before our our, our legislators go back and start um, um, campaigning. You know, for the fall. No, no, might be wrong. You're going to just ram it through. Yeah, 
come in and talk about you know, um, um, health care reform, whether that's really the best piece of legislation or whether it could have took a little more time. It had momentum, you know, momentum for change. And we elected, we elected our current body in Congress. We want to change. We're getting it. We're getting it. But, um, that's not different over 100 years. It's not at exactly all. the same. That, that's our political system. It's, it works generally well. And what happens if there's really bad legislation? Over time, it does get <coughs> fixed, but it's, it's it's over time. Accounting changes or valuing loans and deposits, this is awful. <laughs> um, we are, and it looks like it's going to happen. Um, so we have now legislation that's going to create changes at the uh, um, Financial Accounting Standards Board, FASB. And, the legis and this legislation says that banks are going to have to go to mark-to-market -to accounting for their loans and their deposits. What does that mean? That means Every time we produce a financial statement, whether it be monthly, quarterly, or publicly held, or, or, or not, um, we have to value our loans. Okay? And when you think about a financial asset, if I, if I close a loan today that's $100,000 at, at, at a 5% rate, and um, rates go up six months from now to say 7%, the value of that loan is much less. Because if I have to sell it, I have to discount it for somebody to get an effective rate of 7% on that. And the, um, so I have to take a, a hit to my earnings, my capital, if rates go up on the balance, on, 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 my ba on the um, asset side, my balance sheet. So well, it's kind of offset on the, on the, on the liability side. Is my deposits. If I've got a 5% CD and rates go up to 7%, that's more valuable because I'm, I, you know, I'm paying less than what the market is. The, real, the, the, the fact of the matter is our balance sheets don't quite work that way. Um, because if, if rates go up 2%, I'm not going to uh, publicly say, I'm not going to increase my checking account rates by 2%. Okay? We lag. So what happens in an in a rising interest rate environment, um, banks' capitals take a tremendous hit, a hit based on, based on this, this proposed change. Um, and I can tell you one thing, rates aren't going to go a heck of a lot lower than where they are, they are right now. They can't. So the risk is on the upside. So as, as, as we're trying to come out of a recession and provide liquidity to our cu customers, if and rates go up, if we're subject to these accounting changes, we're going to have less capital to do it, which means we have to shrink our balance sheet. We have to loan less. It's 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 counter uh, it, it's counter cyclical, and it's just really bad. I think really bad policy. But but that's in the bill, and and um, as of yesterday, it looks like it's going to stay there. Um, FDIC insurance changes. Um, they're going to make that permanent um, $250,000 limit, and that's going to be codified into, in, into, into law. That's fine, um, kind of. Okay, I say that kind of. I said, who funds the FDIC insurance fund? We do, and we have to fund that so that there's enough money in that fund to cover a certain percentage of all the deposits outstanding. Right now, we fund that up to $100,000. So now we have to now provide insurance for the difference between 100 and 250. The reality is. The 100 was set in the 70s. You know, if you just index for inflation, it's up to two. It's actually a little over 250 now. So it's, it makes sense. It's coming at a time when we're going to have to fund that deposit insurance fund at the time we can least afford it. I can tell you, if you look at our P&L in 2006, we paid 15,000 dollars in insurance to the FDIC insurance fund because it was well capitalized. We, no banks were failing. Didn't need it for anything. It was there. Um, so that was just that was actually. Because of the, the SNL failures, they're still paying them with this, this bond. That's what that was. Okay. In 2007, about the same, 17,000. Okay. 2008, 150,000. 2009, a half a million. At the end of last year, we had to write an additional check out for a million dollars. Okay, to, to to replenish the fund based on the bank failures, and we'll have another half a million dollar expense this year. If this goes through, um, we will be paying a lot more insurance. Okay, so we've got interchange fees that are going away. We've got other fees, and if I have a chance, I'll talk about our um, on overdrafts that are going away. And, um, and my FTSC insurance costs are going to the roof. Um, <coughs> so the only other thing um, I have is a separate, oops, um, separate um, tag. Yeah, temporary account um, guarantee. This is on all um, um, checking accounts, okay, business checking accounts, and, and really it goes over to now. They have an unlimited guarantee on those balances. The concern back in to, at the end of 2008, when there was this credit freeze, if I'm if I'm a business, okay, 
10. Most of us are a small business, you know, so do we have more than 250000 in our checking account? Some do, some don't. But think about um, if I'm um, Cheshire Medical Center, okay? I've got millions of dollars in my checking account because I've got a large payroll, about 1,400 people, right? So in my checking account, and, and um, I won't tell you that they banking, but with a large national bank here in town. Um, <laughs> but, um, but they get concerned about whether it's, it's do they need to take the money out of there? What if they fail? They've got a fiduciary responsibility to make sure that those funds are protected. So the temporary uh, uh, account guarantee program protected all of those, okay? If you were willing to pay for it. So banks have to pay 10 basis points uh, on, on, on all those balances greater than the 250000 that's that's covered. And so you pay additional insurance. Some banks said, I'm not paying that. Being type of person I am, I said, I'm not paying it. If you're not comfortable with our institution, the safety and soundness, come in, talk to me, talk to whoever you want, then I understand that. You have to do the right thing, you know, you know, take those monies elsewhere. I'm not paying that additional. I just fundamentally didn't agree with it. Some say, I have to. I've got, you know, I'm a business, you know, I'm a business bank. I've got, you know, that's most of my deposits. Um, I'm going to lose too many deposits if I don't subscribe to it. They're looking at making this permanent. And and, and codifying into statute that says um, it's just now part all checking accounts uh, at any level um, are guaranteed by the um, FDIC insurance. Fund. Okay, and no longer do you have to pay this premium, but they're going to assess that amount to all of the banks. <coughs> our, our insurance premium is going to go through the roof. Um, and mortgage rent, risk retention. Um, getting to the end here quickly. Um, um, right now, and this is still as of last night, it's still in there, and. It, it's just a bad policy, ladies and gentlemen. They want banks that um, sell to the secondary market, okay, to retain 5% of their risk on their balance sheet. Okay, so 5%. So if we have a, if we close today a um, $100,000 loan and it gets sold to whoever we sell it to, whether it be Fannie or Freddie or whoever, whatever correspondent we sell that loan to, because, why? Because I don't want the interest rate risk of 30 years on my, on my balance sheet. Plus, I want to free that money up so that I can lend it tomorrow to somebody else. Um, they're going to say, you have to retain 5% of that risk through the life of that loan on your balance sheet. I don't even know how I'm going to track it, number one. But two, um, I'm not sure I want to do that anymore. Okay. I'm not sure I want to be in that, that business. So what's your alternative? No, no, not, not, not lend long-term long long term mortgage. No, I, 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 couldn't do it, I couldn't put a 30-year interest rate. I just want to do 30-year mortgage anymore. Want to do a 30-year mortgage? You have to go somewhere else. I don't know. I mean, that that's it's got profound impacts to our bank. So the response, currently the bill is projected to be um, signed before the 4th of July. Um, I don't believe that these bills solve the reason why we have the financial crisis in the first place. Um, I, Frank, we need to address too big to fail. I don't think that this bill adequately addresses too big to fail. It puts in a mechanism to um, wind down a too big to fail bank, which is fine. They wanted to capitalize a fund of 50 billion, some said 100 billion, um, capitalized by the 50 largest banks in the country. And, um, and they put that there so that if one of them failed, that they could, um, they'd have the money there. Um, I, I was vehemently against that because then you promote risk taking because you've got a fund there to take it out. Like, no, I, I just, I think that's just, and, and that's, that, that, I don't think that, that fund's gonna be developed. I think that's off the table at this point. Um, it comes at a time when we're really working hard to do what our legislators want, which is lend, try to understand the needs, be prudent. I mean, the fact is, in a recession, we need to lend less because people can afford less. And, and it's just, that's, that, that's the way it is. I mean, it's not, it's not a healthy dose of, <laughs> of medicine, but that's the reality. Um, this legislation comes on top of over 50 new regulations that have been presented to us in the last 24 months. Okay. Overdraft um, um, regulations that um, opt in. If you've got received something in the mail, you have to opt in if you want the bank to be able to pay um, um, an overdraft on an ATM or, 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 or a point of sale or a debit card transaction. Um, so you have to sign says, "Yep, I want them to pay that." God forbid I happen to be in a situation where I need it. Um, so that's um, that comes out next month, um, July one. Um, the cost of that bill to save the bank of Walpole is one hundred thousand dollars a year. 
we're going to receive $100,000 less in overdraft fees because we're, we've taken a stance. We're not asking our, our customers to opt in. We're just not going to charge them those overdraft fees, okay, on those two months. So $100,000. haven't told, told you anything where I'm going to get additional income yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, just gray hair. But um, so on top of what, um, 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 the compliance costs, I think I have here, the burdens are expected to cost, this, the burdens that are coming um, out of this legislation are expected um, to increase our compliance associated costs, okay, to comply with these by 50%. In 2001, this is for a $300 million financial institution, about the size of, again, Connecticut River Savings Bank of Walpole, for perspective. It's a small bank, you know. Um, but, um, and this is an outside study, it was done by um, um, Northeast Capital. 2001 cost us about 50 grand to comply with the, with the regulations. Some had a part-time compliance officer, but generally management was, was trying to deal with most of the compliance. In 2006, that went up to um, four times that. In 2010, we're spending $400,000 to comply with the current regulations that are in place, and they expect that that could go up to another 50% coming out of this. It's, it, it's mind-boggling. Loss of income sources will be significant in terms of what we can charge. I mentioned overdraft, interchange fees. Um, if if it's considered abusive, deceptive, if it's not in the consumer's best interest, um, if we can't justify why we're charging the application fee, if we, you know, if there are any markup on your on your settlement statement, you, you have to have documentation to support why what the cost was. Okay. Um, there's price fixing going on in the banking business as a result of of the crisis of what's happened. Um, I think long term it's going to reduce the ability to differentiate ourselves from some of the large money centers. Um, and I think it's a shame on, on, on the main streets of, in our community. Um, the, some of the pundits out there are saying that it's going to take the community bank and business out of business. And put us, there's no way. Would it consolidate? You know, if you're, and they're talking about banks that are under a billion dollars. They don't know what the financial um, how they can financially be viable. I can tell you that I firmly believe that in our little shop, <laughs> um, we've got a plan that will be viable. But um, if we had investors, I'm not sure they would like the returns on their investment. Okay, and we don't. So, um, but um, I'm getting calls. I can tell you that of other banks. You want to talk about? You want to do this? And let's kick the tires. We don't know as an industry what long term, the costs that are coming out with income, that are being burdened with, with insurance costs, with um, compliance costs, what it's going to do to our business. Boy, it sounds like, God, <laughs> no one's left. Um, uh, I don't think it's in the consumer's best interest. We've got consumer laws that are being um, 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 presented to protect our consumers, okay? We're business people. If additional costs go on to us, what do we do? Yes. We pass them on, okay? Um, this is in the last couple of days. Um, most people believe we've seen the end of pre-checking accounts. Okay. Yeah. And I don't care what balances you have in your, your account. Um, pre-checking accounts have been for the last what, 10 or 15 years. You haven't had to pay any. You maintain a certain dollar amount or, you know. Um, if we're not getting interchange fees, if we're not getting overdraft fees, if we're not, there were some abusive practices out there. You can, you can, you can legislate those abusive practices. Um, but when these come over all of the industry, um, the, the, the reality is you're probably going to be getting some, some charges on your checking account to pay for the service. So, we haven't made a determination. I, 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 I'm going to say I, I don't know where we're going to go with that. Um, yeah, it's going to be passed on to rate adjustments as well. You are going to pay higher mortgage rates when when we have um, um, more compliance costs, okay, you're going to get paid lower, hard to believe, on your deposits. Because if we have to go back in an industry, we're not going to get any fees. If we got to get back in a margin, we need banks. Okay, we all have we have the need for credit, and we have the need to have our transactions processed through a banking system. Whether it's 8,200 banks, 4,000 banks, or you go to Canada, you got seven banks. It doesn't. You, we all need them. The question is. What's the right model for work in the United States? We are, we're going to a lot lesser banks, you know, in the next decade. Mortgage lending, the future is uncertain. 
it really is. Um, from having to identify what's um, what's in the customer's best interest, their ability to repay, the 5% retention, um, the whole secondary markets being <coughs> legislation, how does it work, how do they bundle, what what what, what promises they to, do they need to make to their investors who are going to buy this uh, buy this paper, and we're just not sure whether it's going to just bog down the mortgage. We'll find ways, okay? It really, and, and, and the reason why the larger banks haven't been lobbying against this legislation other than one piece, the, the derivative, the Volcker rule, they want to be able to continue to have their derivative, their trading business. That's where they make their money, okay? They're not, they're not, they're not afraid of these consumer um, um, rules because it's going to put a lot of us out of business. Okay. So, and again, if we've got $10 trillion in the banking system, it's going to be $10 trillion in the banking system, okay, whether you've got 100 banks or 8,000. 8, so basically, we're going to have like five banks. There, 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 are, there are those who think that there is a desire in Washington. Thanks, Mary Lou. Thank you. Um, to have fewer banks because when you've got fewer banks, it's easier to, to regulate. It's easier, easier to keep your arms around. It's easier, you know, so you don't have these renegades out there. And again, they're like anything, like children, like businesses, like um, there's always going to be a few few bad apples. And, uh, but when you have broad-based legislation that's coming at us, um, it's I don't think it's it's in our best interest. I wish I could be a little more positive. I'm looking at it very myopically. I mean, I get it. And this is, you know, from a banker's perspective, that has to comply with this. And it's easy for me to just say sour grapes. God, they're just bad. Bang, bang. I, as a consumer, I'm very concerned about what this legislation is going to do to our industry and to, to the you know, consumers who desperately need um, access to community banking. Certainly in, in, a, in, a, in a region like the Mananoff region, we need our community banks. But, you know, legislators, they, they get it. They want us here. But th this bill does not, uh, does, doesn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't do the trick for, for them really wanting us here. We'll be fine. Okay. But it's, um, it's, uh, it's going to be tough for seeing some of the larger banks to attract the capital that they need. Because, you know, the returns that banks have historically been able to deliver to their shareholders aren't going to be there. I mean, it's just impossible to deliver those returns. So, uh, do you have these conversations with your staff? Yeah. <laughs> Are they looking yeah. for new jobs? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. Um, yeah, we, we, you know, we keep them, and they see it. I mean, they, they come to us. Oh my gosh! And they're seeing the impact on a, on a regular basis of, you know, meetings and how are we going to do this and how are we we need a new form for this and make sure we. Here's an example. Okay, this is um, Mary, Mary Lou just just left it. She, she, um, she, she saw this firsthand. We, um, we made an error. Now, there's new what's called RESPA um, um, requirements out there. It's a Real Estate um, Settlement Protection Act. And it protects customers um, on the mortgage side. When you um, um, close a loan, you get this settlement agreement. Um, first of all, you get a good faith estimate. I, I, they should rename it. It's a good faith promise. Because if you make a mistake on a good faith estimate, um, you roll it. You own it, and you eat it, okay? We had an example um, of a customer, um, and this, this came in after, was it April 1, the new, uh, and um, through our QA, we saw a customer decided to change what they wanted and, and, and went from a, an internal loan uh, that we were going to book on our books to, to something that was going to be sold, which is fine. Happens all the time. Um, and, and we redisclosed to them based you know, new, uh, um, new parameters on that um, settlement agreement. And we forgot, okay, to include one of the fees, okay. Called the customer back up, you know, a couple days before closing, and they came in and said, oh yeah, it was the transfer tax. It was a big number, 2,000 bucks. And, um, and, uh, and then they came in, wrote the check out, went through another set of reviews that we, 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 we didn't disclose to them within seven, we couldn't close that within seven days of that redisclosure of that, of that $2,800, okay? Customer was fine, I mean, they, we wrote a check out to that customer, Merry Christmas, we can't, we can't take that. We didn't disclose in a timely enough manner, you know, those, those real estate transfer tax. So we wrote a check out them. So, well, who would check, who would find that? They, they were fine with it. Upon review, if, we, if, they, if we would have been 
Um, and we would have. It would have come up in some regu regulatory exam, and they would have extrapolated that over our whole, there'd be civil money penalties if we knew about it and didn't. I mean, so you just do it. That cost, okay, it's going to be borne by our consumers. Somehow, some way, I mean, for us to be viable, if we're going to have a strategy going forward, our cost structure has to be paid for by consumers. So I have a um, so if you're interested in some light reading, it's my, my CFO wrote it, um, I edited it, but and it's, it's really a great document, but it's a little heavy. Does anybody have any final questions? <laughs> yeah. What area would you concentrate in as a community bank to be most profitable? It's still um, in attracting those, what we call low-cost deposits. It's, it's our local um, small business checking accounts. It's the now accounts. Um, because we can still take those those monies and invest them um, somewhere and, and, and make and make enough spread. It's when we have to go out and, and attract more expensive money, whether it be high cost CDs or in, um, borrowing. If you borrow through, through the Federal Home Loan Bank or other, other means, um, it's going to be a tough thing to maintain those margins. So if we focus on take care of our customers locally, and they want to have their, right. their primary um, checking relationship with us. Just trying to be smart. Yeah, we can be profitable. Right. Yeah. Um, I want to thank Greg very much. This has been incredibly comprehensive um, to, to go through and frightening. And I feel like <laughs> I just heard the whole thing about the health care system, and now I've heard the whole thing about the banking system, and I think I'm moving to Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so thank you okay. very, okay. very, very much. A few additional announcements. I put up an evaluation if you'd be kind enough to fill that out. Going along with the evaluation, if you're a member of the chamber, which I believe all of you are, uh, you received uh, a request to fill out a survey on SurveyMonkey. It came about uh, two days ago. Um, we're getting really excellent response. We're asking you to send it to anybody in your organization. It's not just whoever gets the email should fill it out. It's anybody who has anything to do with the chamber at any level. So hopefully we'll get thousands of responses. Um, so look for that, and if you didn't get it, call me and I'll, and I'll make sure you get it. Um, our golf tourney is August 4th. We're looking for golfers and sponsors. Uh, talk to Tom, he'd be the guy. Um, and last but not least, uh, this weekend, Friday and Saturday, is uh, a program called the Center City Design. And I'm going to let you talk about it rather than me. Uh, Center City Design is uh, a community conversation. There are four projects proposed for, planned for uh, Gilbo Avenue. Uh, Antioch, New England's campus will be there. Keene State College is going to build an athletic and civic center facility. Um, Arts Alive is going to add on to the Colonial uh, Theater, uh, a performance theater and rehearsal rooms and recording rooms, and the City of Keene uh, is going to be building a parking deck. Um, most of the activity will be on the south side of Gilbo Avenue, where Shabbat uh, Towers are, the, the, the silos. Uh, the parking deck will be uh, behind Lindy's. Uh, and what the objective of this uh, session is, Friday is informational to come and learn more about those planned projects. Saturday is more interactive. We're, we're going to have tables around the room. Where people can come in. once again for their hospitality. Um, thank you, Patrick. Uh, thank you, Bill, Eastern Video, for um, videoing our breakfast forums and uh, getting them on Channel 8.
I hope. Um, and once again, Greg, thank you so much for your preparation and your passion and your knowledge. Thanks, everybody, for showing up.